It's good to see you. I am so glad to get to preach to some people. I tell you, it has been such a, a task. I mean, preaching to the camera and imagining there's somebody out there, you know. But uh, it is so good to see you. Thank you for being here this morning as we do this trial run and, and train and get ready for the real thing next uh, Sunday. Father's Day when we'll be inviting all of our membership to come and to be with us, and we are so excited about the opportunity to get back together to worship in person as well as online. And I hope those folks that uh, are worshiping online who cannot come back right now will continue to be faithful online because we are so glad to have you to be a part of our worship time, and we covet your prayers for us as we meet here, but also as the Word of God is proclaimed out uh, in what whatever parts of the world it goes into. But thank you. It's so good to be here with you this morning and looking forward to this uh, time together. Now, you know, we have been looking uh, at a couple of guys trying to deal with the situation that, you know, there, there are people that claim to be Christian. They say, you know, I'm a follower of Christ. But when you look at their life, boy, it, it just doesn't look like it, does it? I mean, it's so inconsistent. And sometimes we look at those folks and we think, well, these people are not Christians. If they were Christians, they wouldn't do like that. Hey, you know what? There's some times when you've done some things and people have said, you know, if you were a Christian, you wouldn't do those things. And you may have even said to yourself, how can I be a Christian and think like this or act like this? Well, what we've discovered is that when you become a follower of Christ, you don't automatically mature, uh, jump out as a mature believer. And in fact, what we're looking at in examining Abraham and Lot, we're observing that there are mature believers and there are immature believers, and that all of us are growing toward becoming more and more like Jesus. As we have looked at these two men, and the Scriptures, of course, are in Genesis 18 and 19, what we've discovered is they're not in the same place. And we also discovered last time their prayers are really, really different, although both prayed. And today, I want us to look at the impact, the, the, the influence, the power of their life, because these men leave a legacy. One has a noble legacy, the other not so noble. And so, I want us to look here at some Scripture. I want to read uh, some verses out of Genesis 18. Actually, I want to read the first eight verses in 18 and the first three verses in chapter 19, because that sets the stage for our examination of these men with reference to the, the, the influence of their life. In Genesis chapter 18, and in verse 1, we read, Now the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre, while he was sitting at the gate door, at the tent door, in the heat of the day. And when he lifted up his eyes and looked, behold, three men were standing opposite him, and when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them, and bowed himself to the earth, and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in your sight, please do not pass your servant by but please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourself under the tree. And I will bring a piece of bread that you may refresh yourselves and that you may go on since you have visited your servant. And they said, so do as you have said. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, quickly prepare three measures of uh, fine flour, knead it and make bread cakes. Abram also ran to the herd and took a tender and choice calf and gave it to the servant, and he hurried and prepared it. And he took curds and milk and the calf which he had prepared and placed it before them, and he was standing by them under the tree as they ate. Now, this is Abraham's preparation or his encounter with the Lord and the two, two uh, angels. Over in ja uh, chapter 19, we read about Lot, and here's what it says. In verse 1, now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening as Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them, bowed down with his face to the ground, and he said, now behold, my lords, please turn aside into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet that you may rise early and go on your way. They said, however, no, but we shall spend the night in the square. Yet he urged them strongly, so they turned aside to him and entered his house, and listen to this, and he prepared a feast for them and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. Now, we'll come back to that in just a minute. As we look at these men, <clears throat> there is a, a tremendous contrast in several areas. Number one is there's a contrast in faith. These men do not have the same level of trust in God. Not only that, but that faith also impacts their finances, that is, their giving. 
and uh, it, that faith also, in fact, uh, affects their relationship with their families. And then finally, it also impacts or determines their future. That's what we're going to be looking at. Looking, first of all, at Abraham as a man of faith, the faith of these men. Abraham is noted for his faith. As a matter of fact, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 11 says, by faith Abraham, when he was called, obeyed, going out to a place which he was to receive for inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. Now, let me ask you, have you ever started on a trip not knowing where you're going? I mean, you're behind the wheel, and you drive out the driveway, and your wife says, where are we going? I have no idea. We're just going to go wherever the Lord leads. I mean, you don't go that way, do you? But he did. He was trusting God, and so he left the Ur of the Chaldees, and uh, uh, Lot was with him. And the Scripture says on down in verse 10, for he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Abraham was looking for the promise of God. He, he wasn't looking for just another town or city. He was looking to walk and be with God. And I think that's what the goal of all of us as as we mature in our spiritual life, ought to be, to walk with God and to be with God, and, and that's Abraham. He, by faith, left there of the Chaldees. That's where he was previously to coming to Canaan, and he brought himself, his family, and Lot came with him. Now, it's interesting, in contrast, when you look at Lot, he is not mentioned in the book of Hebrews. As a matter of fact, he apparently was dependent for his faith upon his uncle. In other words, wherever Abram went, he went, and he did whatever Abram told him to do. And so he followed, but when the time came, he had little or no spiritual vision because he made a choice by looking at the well-watered plains. You remember that? He made a choice looking at what he could see and what he could get for himself. And unfortunately, that is an indication of the spiritual level of Lot, and it's a spiritual indication of those today who are, are looking for a bird in the hand rather than waiting on God to provide something that might even be better. And so, here's an application that comes out of this. The reality is this, that people of faith lead the way. It takes strong faith to reach out to risk and to follow God. People who do not have a strong faith follow those who do have strong faith. And not only that, unfortunately, my experience through these years has been a lot of times those folks with weak faith, they hinder those that have faith that want to step out because they just can't see it. They're, they've got to operate on what I think I can do. They cannot understand that God wants us to do what He can do, not what we can do. And so, faith. When you come back to the writer of Hebrews again, he makes another statement. He says that by faith, Abraham and Sarah had a child when he was 100 years old. And Sarah is old. She's beyond childbearing. Here's what it says in verse 11. By faith, even Sarah herself received ability to conceive even beyond the proper time of life, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, there was born even of one man, and him as good as dead, at that, as many descendants as the stars of heaven, and in number, and innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. In other words, what we find is they didn't have any children. They had been waiting. God had made a promise. Twenty years earlier, a, a, the baby came twenty years after it was announced in Genesis 18 that Sarah was going to have a child. They waited upon God, and then God gave them that child. You remember that they kind of ran ahead of God a little bit, and that's where Ishmael came from. I mean, we, we don't want to run ahead of God. We need to wait on God. And, and that's what hit their faith was, and that's what they did. It's so interesting to me that Lot already had children. Now, we don't know how many children, but we know that he did have children. And uh, we'll, we'll look a little bit later at this, but the writer of Hebrews tells us that Abraham took that one child of his and offered him as a sacrifice. I mean, one of the most overwhelming or, or di disturbing pictures in the Bible is this where it says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, who had received the promise and was offering up his only begotten son. It was he to whom it was said, in Isaac, your descendants shall be called. 
And then this statement is made. He, Abraham, considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. So Abraham believed God. And when God says, I want you to go sacrifice your son, he did it. He was prepared to take the child's life. God didn't let him do it. He provided a ram for the sacrifice. But the fact is, in his mind and in his heart, he already had done it. And that's the reason God says, I know you have not withheld anything from me. And by faith, God was able to bless him. Now, he was literally offered on a sacri- as a sacrifice on an altar. What about Lot? Well, he didn't offer his children like that. But I think there can be an argument made that Lot sacrificed his children on the altar of social acceptance and lifestyle. He moved into the city, and the city had an influence upon their life, as we shall see here in just a few moments. So these men are not equal in their faith. They're not at the same level in their faith. One has a very strong faith, and the other has a weak faith. It's illustrated, I think, in their finances or in their giving. (laughs) I read these first few verses of each chapter because it kind of tells that story. It it, it appears, you know, it looks as though Lot is about to outdo his uncle, for he says here in in 19.3, and he prepared a feast for them. Now, if you go back up here to verse 5 in chapter 18, what you'll find is that he said, and I will bring a piece of bread. That's what Abraham said. And so it appears that the immature believer is going to outdo the mature believer. But then when you get and make a closer examination, what you find is that Abraham, that Lot's feast was, as it says here in the text, and he he baked unleavened bread and they ate. Unleavened bread? Yeah, I get to think of that. That's kind of like uh, people in, uh, that I've read about in prison where they're given bread and water, you know? They don't seem like very much. But that's what it says he did. Now, how about Abraham? He said, let me get a little piece of bread. And then it takes three verses to describe the preparation and the feast that Abraham prepared and gave to the, 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 the men. And, and I got to thinking about this. When you think about it, mature believers delight in generosity. Immature believers have not yet learned the joy of giving. Mature believers can claim the promises of God, and God makes wonderful promises relative to our giving. Here's what Jesus says, give, and it will be given to you. They will pour it into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. God has made those wonderful promises, and it's the mature person in his faith who learns to have joy in making those, doing that giving because he knows, number one, that God is going to bless him in doing it, and you can't outgive God. The immature believer hasn't learned that yet. He's still struggling. You know, the, I got the, the immature person thinks that he knows better. In other words, let me just ask you this question. If I told you that if you'll give away, you'll have more, does that sound logical to you? Uh, You know, the human mind says, if I give it all away, I'm not going to have anything. And, And from a human standpoint, that's the way. But the fact is that God says, as you give, it's going to be given to you. And it's going to be pressed down. It's going to be shaken together. It's going to be running over. That's the difference in walking by faith and walking by sight. And so what we find is Abraham, I don't know if you thought about this, Abraham's the first recorded person in the Bible to give a tithe. He's the first one that I I know anything about that gave a tithe. Now, it apparently was practiced, but here is the record of it. What we find is that Abraham gave a tithe to a guy, a priest by the name of Melchizedek. It's in Genesis 14, and it's in verses 18 through 20. You remember that Lot was taken captive with the kings of the valley, and Abraham went and brought them all back. And when they come back, here's what it says. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now, he was a priest of God most high. 
And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of, of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered you, delivered your enemies into your hand. And here's the statement. He, that's Abram, gave him a tenth of all. A tithe. Tithe literally means a tenth. So this is the first instance we have in this. Now, you remember that they offered to Abraham the spoils. He said, no, I don't want any of it, except for what these men have gone with me need. But he gives a tenth of it to Melchizedek. We don't know uh, who Melchizedek is. He just shows up. But he is a forerunner of Jesus, and he gives him this gift. The indication here is he is not greedy. He is not He is liberal in his his giving. He is open to sharing what God has made available to him. And and that's the whole heart of the the mature person who has grown and learned you cannot outgive God. Can I just give you a little personal testimony? I tell people all the time I'm a a successful man. And they say, how's that? I say, well, I got five young'uns. They all bought and paid for, and all of them have a college degree. And, I, and God has provided. The Lord provided. I mean, I have, on the meager salary and the struggle of myself going to school, we were able to do it. How is that possible? Because God gives when we are faithful and He makes a way. And I'm just telling you, learn to walk with God and He will bless you and He will help you in whatever you need. So, these men are not the same. Their faith is de- demonstrated in their giving but it is also very evident in their family. When we look at their families, Abraham was a man who reared his family and taught his family the way of God. Now, I know that because God says that. Here in Genesis chapter 18, look at verses 17 through 19. And the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Since Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation, And in him all the nations of the earth will be blessed. For I have chosen him so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. God knew that Abraham was going to transmit his faith to his children. God knew that. that. And that's exactly what he did. And consequently, his family was a blessing. You know, there's, I think, an application here for parents and grandparents. We, the first order of responsibility is to communicate our faith to our children. Not only teaching them, telling them about it, but demonstrating it and helping them to begin to practice faith on 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 themselves. Have you ever thought about this? God is referred, he, when they're describing God, how do they describe him in the Old Testament? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, why? Because Abraham's faith was transmitted to his son Isaac, and Isaac transmitted that faith to Jacob, and that's God's plan for us to pass it on down. I love the words of that song, may all who come behind us find us faithful. That's where we are. That's what we need to be, is faithful in doing what God has given us to do right now and having that kind of positive influence on our children. Now, in contrast to that, we look at Lot and find that the Scriptures indicate here that he had two daughters in in his house that that escaped with him. But he perhaps had more children than that. I find it interesting here that when they take hold of him, they, uh, they, they say, if you've got any children here, he says in, in uh, verses 14 and 15, and Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who were to marry his daughters and said, up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he appeared to his sons-in-law to be jesting. And when morning dawned, the angel urged Lot, saying, up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be swept away in the punishment. Now, I mean, did you pick up on what it said here? The two daughters who are here. In other words, there, were there daughters somewhere else? Were there sons somewhere else? Were there other family members? We don't know for sure. What we do know, though, is that these two daughters, plus any other children that he had, were influenced by the city and the, the wickedness of the city. 
his, these men that were to marry his daughters are skeptical, and even the children are skeptical that this is really going to happen. Is God really going to destroy the whole city? And, and the reality is that when we fail to teach our kids early, then later on they are resistant. Heard about this guy who went to a camp meeting back in the years ago when they had tent meetings. He went to a camp meeting. He was 80 years old. And so he goes to this camp meeting, and the, own, the unbelievable thing happened. God met him, and he met the Lord and yielded his life. He got saved. He gave his life to God. And then he comes home, and he goes to his kids, and he's saying to his kids, listen, let me tell you what God did tonight and what God has done in my life. And his children replied, okay, Dad, we understand. And when we get to be your age, we'll think about doing that too. In other words, you waited till you were 80, we'll wait till we're 80, but the reality is very few people 80 years old ever come to Christ. You realize that, don't you? Years ago, I preached a revival meeting in a place called Cumberland, Mississippi. You know, y'all know where that is? I preached at Cumberland Baptist Church, and I wish I had time to go into all the story. I'm just going to tell you that there was a guy that came into that service, Uncle Ely, and Ely Mitchell, and he came stumbling in. And after the service, he wanted to introduce me to his wife. I said, well, I'd be glad to meet her. And so he led me out the back door of the church, out into the cemetery to a grave site, and he introduced me to his wife and her to me. And we're standing there, and he said, you see that tree right yonder? I said, yeah. He said, the last man hanged in Webster County was hanged on that tree. He said, I was just a kid of the boy at the time, but I saw him hanged on that tree. And he said, they brought him down, it was a dirt road then, he said, brought him down that dirt road and said, you got anything you want to say? And the, the kid said, yeah. He said, go over to that bush and uh, uh, sapling and, and m- m- uh, stomp it down. And so the man went about big around your thumb and he put his foot against it and down it went. Then the boy said, go over to this one over here. And it was about as big as a wrist. The man put his foot against it and tried to push it, but it wouldn't go. So he got up at the top, pushed it hard and it broke as it was going down. And then he said, the kid on the horse that was about to be hanged said, that's the reason I'm being hanged today. When I was young and could be shaped, my mom and daddy didn't have any time for me. But when I grew up and got set in my ways and stubborn, then they tried to teach me the right way, but I wouldn't do it. That young man was hanged as a consequence of things he did but he was way he was because his parents had not taken time to invest in him in the early years. I determined that day, my kids may say a lot of things about me. I hope some of them are good. But one of the things they're going to say is they're not going to be able to say, my daddy didn't try to lead me and teach me in the right way. I determined then I was going to live for God before them, and I was going to do everything I could to lead them to know God. And I want to tell you, God has honored that, and I'm so grateful for the way he has blessed our family. I'm just saying to you that we have an influence on our family, and that then consequently impacts our future, their future and our future. When you look at the story, what you'll find, and I want to look at Lot first because I want to end on a positive note. When you look at what happened here in the text, what you'll find is that Lot escaped out of the city, took his two daughters with him and uh, his wife, and they were going to the little town of Zoar. And uh, the, the Scripture says that Lot's wife looked back and turned into a pillar of salt. You remember that part of the story? This one little kid, was teacher told him that, about that story, and that little boy said to his teacher, he said, that ain't nothing. He said, my mama looked back and turned into a telephone pole. I mean, the whole idea here is that, you know, it only left the two girls and Lot. And what do they do? They go to the city of Zoar, then they go into the mountain. And when they get into the mountains, the girls seduce their father. Listen to this. It's one of those sordid stories in all the Bible. Here's a consequence of it in verse 36 through 38 of Genesis 19. Thus, both daughters of Lot were with child by their father. And the firstborn bore a son, and they called him Moab. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. And as for the younger, she also bore a son and called his name Ben-Ami. He is the father of the sons of Ammon to this day. 
I don't know if you know Old Testament history, but when Israel came out of Egypt and they were going to the promised land, they tried to go across the land of the Ammonites, they tried to go through the, uh, the land of the Moabites, and they would not let them. And so they had to circumvent them. My whole point being this, that the conflict between Abraham's prodigy, his children, and Lot's children <laughs> went on for years, and still some of the conflict in the Middle East is a consequence of this decision. And so what we find here is Lot dies unsung, unhonored, unpraised, and he left a prodigy that continues to be a negative thing in the world today. So, what about Abraham? You do realize that three great religions, I mean three major religions today, three major religions trace their ancestry back to Abraham. The Muslim faith traced their ancestry back to Abraham through Ishmael. And the Hebrew people traced their ancestry back to Abraham through Isaac. And you and I trace our ancestry back to Abraham through faith. We are sons and daughters of Abraham by faith. Listen to what it says in Romans 4 and verse 16. For this reason, it is by faith, in order that we may be in accordance with grace, so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but of those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. And so your spiritual father and mine is Abraham. We trace our heritage back to him through the faith. It was by faith that Abraham left there of the Chaldees. It was by faith that he had a child. It was by faith that he continued serving God, and it was by faith that he set the example for all of us. Now, here is the issue. Are you setting an example to be followed in faith? Are you transmitting your faith to other, your family and to others? I mean, when you look at this, I, I look at... Uh, some of the pastors I know, great pastors like Jim Futrell, and realize his father was a pastor. And I look on down the way and I see a lot of other people that Jim's son is in the ministry. The whole idea is <clears throat> that faith, once it's begun to be passed on, it, it, it goes on. It's imperative that you and I begin to share our faith and form the future as a consequence of it. So here's, here's the question. Where are you? Where are you in your journey? Where are you in your faith? Have you matured in your faith? Are you walking with God on a daily basis? Are you a mature believer or an immature believer? What about with reference to your giving? What about re reference to the influence on your family? I mean, I think we need to examine ourselves. What kind of a legacy are you going to leave? What do you want the people to say when they stand up for your funeral service? What will they say about the way you lived your life? I hope that they'll be able to say, this was a woman of God. This was a man of God. This was a follower of Christ in every way. I hope that can be said of you, and I hope that you're doing it. It may be that you say, well, I, I, I am a follower, I am a believer, but I've kind of gotten off a little bit. Got kind of slacked up, need to renew. That's a wonderful good thing about, about God. God gives us other chances. And so this morning, if you just simply want to say, God, I want to yield my life afresh to you. I want to re to pledge my allegiance to you once again. Then you can do that. You can do it right here, right now. You can do it right there where you are. God hears you. He's there with you, just like He's here. And so I pray that you will do exactly that. But it's possible that someone's listening to my voice, and you have your, your mom and daddy shared the gospel, but you didn't receive it. I talked to a man this morning who told me, I, I'm not a follower. I'm, I'm not a Christian. And basically what he says is, I worship nature. And I told him, you know, nature 
is an indication of God. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the earth shows forth His handiwork. And Paul writes in Romans 1 that, you know, they're without excuse because what is known about God is seen in, in, in the creation. But if you've never given your heart to Christ, you can do it today, and I pray that you will. What you need to do is, first of all, acknowledge you need Him. Second is repent of the way you've lived your life away from Him, and then yield your life to Him and say, Jesus, come into my heart and save my life. Would you do that? I trust that you will. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time to worship. Lord, we welcome your presence here. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for moving among us. Lord, we are grateful that you're not limited to this room where I am, but Lord, you're there in the homes and in the vehicles or wherever people are listening right now. Lord, I pray that you would make them, make your presence evident to them. And then, Lord, lead them to respond in the way that you want. May your will be done in every life. Father, we honor you. We thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving yourself as our substitute. Thank you for paying the price for us. And, Lord, we're just overwhelmed by your goodness. And now, Lord, we want to please you. We want to honor you. And if there's anything displeasing in our life, make us aware of it so we can get it out right now. And, Lord, if there's anyone who needs to say yes to Jesus and yield their life to him, help them to do it right now. We trust you to do that. In Jesus' name, amen.